Julie, can you unmute? Welcome everyone to today's Cisco chat. I'm Julie Neeson, Thought Leadership Marketing Manager for the Intent-Based Networking Group here at Cisco, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. We are really excited to talk about multi-cloud and how you can use it to optimize the user experience around software as a service and infrastructure as a service. Now, before we get started, um, a reminder that we'll be taking your questions live at the end of the show. Post your questions in the comments if you're watching on cisco.com slash go slash Cisco chat, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, and use the Cisco chat hashtag on Twitter. But first, I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves. So Danny, would you like to start? Sure. Hi, Julie. Uh, my name, hi, everyone out there around the world. My name is Dan McGinnis. I lead the uh, IBM Thought Leadership uh, product marketing team, as well as the data center product marketing team here at Cisco. Um, I've got about 20 years in the industry, the first half spent on the customer side. So I was building, installing, managing the architecture and the operations team that, uh, that you know, similar to what you guys are doing, although a lot has changed since then. And then uh, moved over onto the vendor side and have been doing sales and, and product marketing ever since. So uh, look forward to sharing some of the insights that we're seeing here at Cisco with you today as, as we get a little uh, further along into this. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks, Julie, and thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. My name is Kieran Gabdankar. I am a senior marketing manager at Cisco. I lead our enterprise uh, marketing portfolio focused on uh, SD-WAN and enterprise routing. Been at Cisco for about eight years. Uh, spent the majority of my time in networking and telecommunications with a brief stint in uh, clean tech. And, uh, you know, I've been in, I, I've worked as a technical support engineer through product management, a uh, little bit of customer engineering, and, and now really focused on, uh, on, on product marketing here at Cisco. I think Julie, you're on mute again. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the legacy model was just connecting to the cloud rather than optimizing its connectivity and automation. I'm guessing that most of our attendees have started their journey to cloud connectivity and maybe even multi-connectivity, but I'm sure you're also wondering how to scale to keep up with demand, especially with the current increase in work from home and other remote access. So Danny, how do you define multi-cloud? Hmm. So I don't know, this is, um, we, we have so many different names and, and acronyms in this uh, in this space that we that we support and, and all work in. I, I think it's a it's a good question, actually. Um, so multi cloud in my mind is really the evolution of hybrid cloud. So we've been for, for quite some time. We've really been trying to master this space of hybrid cloud where we have some on premise environment shared with the movement to public cloud, whether that be in an AWS or a GCP or an Azure or even something like a bare metal cloud like IBM. And then multi-cloud adds a whole nother dimension to it, in my opinion, where um, you, you have multiple clouds. In fact, that's the more realistic scenario, right, is that almost every customer that I speak to does not have one cloud or one SaaS-based application. Their, their data, their workloads, uh, their their applications are all sort of distributed between their on-premise environment as well as multiple uh, public clouds and even SaaS-based applications. So that's how we at Cisco define multi-cloud. I think you're muted again, Julie. Yeah, Julie. Yeah. <sighs> all right, I mean, gotta love probably, technology, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, Kieran, why don't you talk to me a little bit about the main networking challenges that IT teams are seeing when implementing multi-cloud? 
Yeah, great, great question. I think kind of builds on what Danny was talking about, right? I think um, I, I really had the opportunity to launch, um, you know, a good uh, five years ago, Cisco's first virtual router into Amazon Web Services, right? Right at the beginning when, when AWS was starting to take off. And, and back then, it was really the challenge um, of building hybrid cloud environments and how can I really extend my enterprise into AWS? And at the time, you know, AWS had a proprietary stack and it, didn't, it was different to what people were familiar with on-prem. And so, you know, we took the opportunity to, to launch a virtual router into uh, AWS and make it now so that your, your AWS uh, uh, instance was able to, you know, you could manage it the same way as you were managing your, your on-premise devices. And then, you know, we we saw the you know we saw Google Cloud come into the picture. We saw uh, Amazon, come, uh, sorry Microsoft, come in with with virtual WAN, and so all of these clouds are, are are different, right? They all have proprietary networking stacks, and there's many many different ways to connect to them, right? So there's uh, you, you know the, there's the advent of co-location providers like uh, Equinix. Um, our own traditional service providers have uh, express routes or, or fast paths into each one of these cloud providers. So I think the, the, the challenge for, uh, for our customers is really what is the best way to do this, right? And um, as customers want to uh, reduce their ris risk and, and diversify a little bit and have a multi-cloud uh, architecture, then it's like, how do I, you know, how do I manage it? You know, how do I manage and monitor all of these different environments? Um, should I use a co-location provider? What type of connectivity should I use at my remote site? So I think the the, the challenge is there's a lot of different ways to do this, and and um, I, I think customers are sort of trying to ask and, and reach out to each other and each other in the community, um, or reach out to vendors and say, you know, please help me as I as I try to figure this out. Sure. Um, so, what kind of customer successes are we seeing um, with multi-cloud, Danny? So, you know, kind of building on what on what uh, Kieran said there, you know, if you if you look at the challenge, I mean, the challenge whether or not you're on the transport side of how do you connect to your your cloud in a systematic way, in a simplified way, or what do you do once your workload is now distributed across multiple locations? Um, these are really, really big challenges. I mean, in fact, they seem very easy on paper. And I think that the, the first way that customers are succeeding is I think they're acknowledging what they're trying to achieve. So a lot of customers will claim a hybrid cloud experience or a multi-cloud experience. And I'm not trying to say whether the claim or not is wrong. But I think striving for where you could be based on the tools and technology that are out there is, is part of the problem, right? Acknowledging just what you actually can do realistically in the current state of day and age. And so to me, what that means is that, yes, you have instances or workloads or applications is in a public cloud and you have them on-prem, but really what you're striving for is for them to look, act, and feel like one. You have cohesive security around that. You have cohesive automation around that. Your analytics and insight are all similar. You're not managing one application completely separate than the way it looks like when it's on premise. And so I would say that the best customers, the one that are furthest along, are the ones that are truly striving for that and using the technology available to them to achieve that and build from the ground up. They're the ones that aren't trying to go back and put band-aids and fix everything. I mean, maybe they already had that problem, but they've they've gone past that, or their new greenfield environments are being built up front to look, act, and feel like one. And just to add another dimension, there's the edge side of it as well. We're seeing a whole movement towards uh, the compute edge. In telco, we're seeing it with 5G, we're seeing it with IoT, we're seeing it in large enterprises where they want more computation closer to the end user. Um, and that is just, you know, exponentially making this problem more difficult to solve for. But if you start with comprehensive tool sets, you start with cohesive management, you start with, you know, end to end automation. This is not an 
as complex, relevantly speaking, uh, problem to solve. And Danny, just building off of what you said here, um, can you talk a little bit about the technology um, that um, really makes that on-prem versus cloud experience cohesive? Yeah, I mean, you know, on the data center side, I'm a little, I'm a little more, you know, uh, sure. familiar with the DC side here, and can probably give some better examples on the WAN side. I think like, one example would be what we did with with ACI, um, and frankly, we've even brought this technology into DC and M as well, in how we've taken what we can do on premise. So, you know, ACI has always been the flagship uh, management SDN controller for the on premise data center. Sure. And DCNM is is right there with it when it comes to automation and, and just managing your environment um, end to end. Taking that and then extending that same uh, premise, that same capability into AWS, into Azure. If anybody of you, you know, if you've been following the announcements that we've been making on the DC side, that's been the big motion for us. Is and and I'll just be very specific here for a second. The the way we look at ACI and the approach we've taken, um, I, I tend to use this universal remote control analogy quite often. So in my house, I am responsible for tech. Like that's my job, dad <laughs> going to that. And so for my, if you look at my family room, I've got a DVD player, I've got a cable player, cable box, I have a TV, um, you know, a couple other Apple TV, and they all have different menus, different remote controls. I own all that, right? I'm the guy that sets that up. <laughs> My fest and my family, they don't want to know about it. They want to hit play movie, watch Netflix, you know, you know, play, play Nintendo Switch. And I look at each one of those, you know, Apple TV or the TV as being AWS or Azure, where they have their own unique configuration, but there's that universal remote that sits in front of it and unifies it, right? They, they take out the nuances of each of the individual locations. And that's really what's allowing operators there's a lot of this is really focused on the operation side of the house it's allowing operators to deliver the slas that they customers want and be able to be nimble enough to deliver that cloud-like experience but in a multi-cloud world it is a really approachable analogy i like that a lot danny um <laughs> yes of course um i kind of want to i kind of wonder if you have a vcr in there too but you know that's probably another cisco channel. i had to retire that one <laughs> <laughs> Kieran, could you talk a little bit more um, from the enterprise side, networking side? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think Danny had a good point. I think when you, you know, there's sort of two parts to this equation on the multi-cloud side. There's, there's what, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's, the com there's the compute and, and, and storage and resources and the applications that are, are really moving out of the data center and, um, or, or moving from the data center into the cloud and then you know you've got hybrid environments as well so it's really the application uh, developers that are really moving at breakneck speed right and and really um we've seen that um on the on the dc side where customers are really starting to ask you know as they build out applications they're starting to use containers microservices um architectures they're starting to build out best of breed applications and um and they want, you know, they want the best of what Google offers. They want the best of what, uh, you know, Oracle offers, um, and all the other cloud cloud providers. So that 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 results in, in in more complexity actually from a networking side, which is how do I, you know, now my applications are spread over all these different clouds. How do I actually connect, right, and and get my users to to Danny's point to those applications as quickly as possible and and deliver the best user experience, right? So the this is where kind of SD WAN comes in, and you know one of the things that you know we, we made the acquisition of Viptela back in 2017, and, and one of the big value propositions of Viptela was that it wasn't a software defined networking solution, classic where you had that separation of data data and control plane, and that enabled them to have a single WAN fabric that you could stretch across all of your different remote locations and then all of the different clouds that you're connecting to. And so what that means is, is that when you have a single fabric, now it becomes a lot, lot more easier to route users over those over that fabric, um, find what is the best performing path 
to uh, to the application where that user wants to go to, um, and then make sure that you, you know you're meeting some type of quality of you're able to maintain some some type of quality of service. So, being able to provide policy is is key here. And I, if I have a single policy, if I have a single WAN fabric, now I can apply a policy and push that out to all of my locations very very easily. So, I think having um, a single WAN fabric that um, you know, provides that automation policy management that Danny was talking about at the transport or networking level, um, in addition to what's going on at the uh, application level can be really, really powerful for, uh, for uh, our customers. Great. So kind of going back to that concept of the universal remote um, to make it you know, approachable for you know, less networking savvy folks. Um, but, uh, that, that universal remote makes for a good experience in your living room. So, Kieran, what do you think makes a good multi-cloud user experience? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same concept, right? Which is having that central management point, right? So, I think um, you know, again, it comes back to that architecture and being able to have uh, a single WAN fabric and then having that single control point. Now, um, a, a cloud-based controller can really, really help because it's looking over all of your infrastructure uh, and it's monitoring all of the paths, right? We commonly use, when people ask me to describe how you know, we select the best path to send our users on, um, the Waze example is the classic one, right? Because everybody uses Waze these days. And mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we all know that the shortest path or the shortest distance isn't necessarily the fastest. Right, and so we have to look at two things, which is really how is our underlying connectivity working? Right, uh, I think in, in in Danny's case is uh, you know is his WebEx getting priority over all his Netflix traffic? Right, and and if it isn't, then maybe we can deprioritize that Netflix traffic or send it over a less expensive or less critical link. Right. Uh, and then focusing back on a WebEx or collaboration se session, which is, you know, what is the best path uh, to the WebEx servers that um, is going to deliver a great user experience. So, um, so we do it at multiple levels. And, I'll, you know, I can obviously talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into, into the session. Awesome. Thank you. So let's just take a little short break from questions. And um, we've got a video that's going to come up on managing multi-cloud security. The promise of the multi-cloud world is amazing, right? It's great being free to choose what stays on-prem and what lives on different private, public, or hybrid clouds. But let's be real. While connecting to all those clouds is easy, Managing the different environments can get complicated, fast. Even if you're connecting directly, you don't usually own those connections, so it can be difficult to extend your networking protocols or security policies into the cloud, especially when there's more than one cloud. Co-location connections only complicate matters more. And what about all those untethered devices your workforce uses to access cloud-based apps? How many of them bypass your policies altogether? Fortunately, it doesn't have to be this way. With Cisco, you get the ability to connect, protect, and consume cloud with the control, security, and consistency you need. Learn more about Cisco Cloud Solutions for a multi-cloud world. This actually leads to a great question. So, Kieran, talk to me about how you can use security to protect users and applications? Yeah, this is a big topic, Julie. Um, and, you know, Danny, <laughs> feel free to, to chime in here because I think security is top of mind for everybody, right? And I think, um, you know, what, you know, if I look from, from our perspective, I, I think that there's sort of two factors here, which is number one, which is now, you know, if we look at SD-WAN as an example, really the, what, what SD-WAN, uh, enabled was the ability for customers to lower their WAN costs. And they were really doing it um, by using alternatives to traditional MPLS, right? And I know we have a global audience here, so this 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 answer um, will you know be different in different different parts of the world. But I'll give North America as the example where you know MPLS costs can be 
um, you, you know, can be higher than the connectivity that we get at home, right? And we're all used to pretty fast connectivity at home. And it's pretty reliable these days. So customers wanted to do two things. They, they either wanted to enable backup links or they wanted to use the internet more. And if we start using the internet, then ultimately that is a network which uh, IT doesn't control, right? Well, the internet is made up of multiple different networks. So the concern is, is how do I protect my data as it's traveling over all of these networks outside of the control of IT? And so, you know, SD-WAN really has to provide, um, you know, has to really encrypt all of that data and applications um, as it passes over uh, the internet. So that's one, which is using, you know, solid encryption capabilities as we connect users and, uh, and transport data and applications over the internet. I think <clears throat> two is also around, um, you know, now managing my SD-WAN fabric, right? At the remote sites, um, one of the benefits was that SD-WAN was being able to, you know, zero touch provisioning, which is I don't need, necessarily need a, a, an expert out of the remote site. I can pre-configure my, my uh, routers back at the HQ or, or edge devices back at my headquarters and then ship them out. So I want to be able to make sure that when they d get deployed and plugged in, that edge device has not been compromised all the way from the factory to the remote location. And I know that device is, is, is secure, right? So that's one aspect of it is on the SD-WAN side. And then the other piece is, is really around cloud delivered security, right? There's a lot of discussion around um, secure internet gateways, cloud delivered security, right? As, as customers start to look at uh, moving to multi-cloud, then previously they would typically send all of their, their remote locations back to the data center. And that was where you had your most trusted security stack. And customers still for, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going away from that architecture overnight. They're really looking at the use cases in their remote locations to determine where do I need security? But one thing that did happen was that in order to speed up the performance of cloud applications, customers said, hey, I want to enable internet access at my branch or direct internet access um, so that my users can get to applications like Office 365 a lot faster. And in order to do that, they were really enabling another egress point on the network and they needed a security stack there to, to, to secure that, right? And so that's when we started to see cloud security stuff come in. Um, you know, at Cisco, we have our own uh, Cisco umbrella, which is a fully fledged um, secure internet gateway with CASB uh, cloud delivered firewall. And so what we can do at the remote side is point our branches towards that uh, cloud security. And again, that reduces our footprint in the branch uh, if, if that use case works. And um, you know it can be easy to easier to deploy and manage because I'm not having to go and manage separate security devices at each remote location. Fantastic. So, um, Danny, how can customers better manage their network policy automation for distributing workloads across multi-cloud? Um, I think the you know the key. Again, I always kind of come back to the thought process, right? Like we have to get ourselves into this mindset of what we can do. So the, the first, I think, is thinking in a way that you're able to... So the ultimate goal that we're trying to achieve, right? You're kind of asking a how. So let's, let's state with the problem statement or what we want to get to. Where we want to get to is that we're able to place workloads, applications based on business priority, as opposed to the way we typically do it on technology limitations. It's quite often we say, man, I would really, it would, it would just be so much better for my business if this application sat here, you know, or it would be better for my business if the application that I developed in AWS came in-house now because financial reasons make, make that more appropriate. It's grown so large that it would be just, it would behoove me to have it here because it's cheaper to run, makes more sense from a security standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe it was, uh, I, it was optimized and it would run better in Azure. I mean, there's a lot of tools that Cisco and other vendors offer now to really look at where you want to run an app. So now we have this problem, right? We know we want to run it somewhere else. 
but it's difficult. We spent a lot of time designing that app to run in one particular environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like a lot of customers are really getting caught up in, I'd like to do this, but I can't because technology has limited me. So if you look at, besides the tools that I just talked about, some of the ones that are a little further up the application stack that are constantly analyzing and making applications be more mobile, right? That's a whole nother conversation we could get into. At the actual network layer, it's really around one, extending what Kieran just said. So how do we take the security policy and extend that? And in our space, in the DC space, it's very much around unified security policy. I don't wanna to have to have a different security policy in AWS or in Azure than I do on-prem. That should just be one. How can I absolutely guarantee security and compliance if I can't monitor it holistically? It's just too many disparate places to look after. And so that's really what ACI allows us to do um, is to manage what that end-to-end -end policy looks like and back to the universal remote control, not worry about what a SPG looks like or what a services gateway looks like or you know the, how AWS provisions routers and firewalls and Azure provisions. It's all unified and looks, acts, and feel like one in the ACI interface, although it's you know leveraging the individual components of each uh, cloud. And that is getting us a lot, lot closer to a more unified look, act, and feel as one environment and making workloads way more portable between sites. Yeah, definitely. Good, good, good points. And I think, um, you know, I think just building on what you just said, which is, I, I think, um, you know, one thing we've definitely seen more of is around um, a use case driven approach, right? And I think that's probably the biggest change I've seen in the industry over the last sort of five, six years, which is you know, you really need to look at your remote users and, and, and how they're accessing their applications and where those applications are hosted because the days of sort of doing cookie cutter are gone now, right? The, the cloud has really opened up a lot of uh, unlimited possibilities for IT now. And, you know, I think from a WAN perspective, as, 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 as users connect back to the application, I, I see IT really sort of looking at each location independently, determining, you know, what do I need from a resources perspective? Edge computing is a great example. You know, if this is a big branch, then maybe I need more on-premise. Oh, if this is a big branch supporting a lot of users, then I need a lot more uh, services uh, and horsepower potentially at the edge. Um, faster connectivity. Um, versus maybe a, a smaller retail or franchise, which is, hey, you know, I can get by with two internet connections and, and, and really I just need to provide guest Wi-Fi and have some redundancy there, right? So um, I think really, really, really good points, Danny. Yeah, you too. You. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling off of something that Kieran said, um, how is, you know, we've got, a lot of people, way more than even three months ago, working remotely. Um, some of us have been doing it for a while, but we have a lot of new people um, who are now working remotely. Um, how um, is security and multi-cloud affected by this influx of new remote workers? Yeah, great, great, great question. I think uh, it's probably the number one question I'm getting right now, which is, I think, you know, SD-WAN, is it for the home? And, you know, how is it being used in, the, in, in, in this, at the time during this pandemic? And I think definitely depending on, you know, what we're seeing is obviously healthcare, probably the most impacted here where, um, you know, pop-up locations are happening all over the world. And those locations need connectivity, right? And you need to be able to use whatever connectivity is available. And we don't, you know, we don't really have a lot of time to bring in lease lines or wait for the provider to provide some type of uh, fixed line connectivity, right? So wireless, definitely 4G um, can play a role here where we can instantly bring up a, a wireless connection. Um, and if we have multiple, then that's great. We can bond them together with, and use SD-WAN there. Um, and then for home users, um, you know, we secure here at Cisco. We're secured by Cisco Umbrella. We use our own product uh, to secure our, all our home users. 
I actually, this comes up quite a bit, which is now I'm not really VPNed in to Cisco anymore, right? I don't <laughs> need to go back to Cisco and then go out to the internet. It doesn't make any sense. Um, we're a big Office 365 uh, shop. And so I just really need fast internet. I, I need good internet access at home. And um, I need to have a secure login. So we all use Duo uh, for um, uh, secure access. And then, um, you know, we use uh, Cisco Umbrella for uh, cloud-based security to protect us, and along with uh, advanced malware protection. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I think a lot of use cases for, for COVID when it comes to uh, remote connectivity. Fantastic. So um, let's uh, actually, last question before we go into our audience questions. We've got quite a few of those. Um, so Danny, and, and this is a big one. What's the future of multi-cloud? Hmm, this is a big one. <laughs> um, I think the future, I think we just hit a major inflection point. So some of the things that Kieran and I are just talking about, you know, these are really just been made available in the last 12 months, you know, not just by Cisco. I mean, as an in, every, things tend to really run cyclical in the industry. Um, I, you know, I would argue that Cisco's really out of in, ahead of this in, in some of the innovations that we're doing and enabling this. Um, I do think one of the, to one of your points about, um, you know, uh, what, what did COVID do to this is I think it accelerated some of the, yeah. some of the need on how people needed so much. I mean, some industries went one way, which is extremely unfortunate, but other industries, the need for bandwidth, the need for networking and infrastructure just blew up. I mean, if you look at some of these subscription services like a Netflix or, you know, where Disney's going, I mean, that's just one small fraction that the amount of bandwidth and the amount of infrastructure that is being consumed and then all our Facebooks and Amazon, I mean, it's just overwhelming. So, so some of this has actually been accelerated. I think in order for it to be successful, uh, and I do believe we're still a little early here, is that the integrations need to start to come in. So, you know, yeah. you've seen us, as when I say us, meaning Cisco, start to talk about our early phases of SD-WAN, campus, um, and data center starting to integrate, the, meaning the controllers are sharing information, you're looking at more comprehensive security policies, shared metadata so that we're not, you know, building three separate security policies for one workflow to get a user to an application. I think that in order to, you know, to kind of bring it all back to my opening statement, in order to truly have this multi-cloud experience, you have to not just want the automation and the security, but the transport, the user uh, area uh, that, that users and, and applications sit, and devices sit, and then as well as where the applications in the data center, those tools need to look, act, and feel like one as well, not three separate areas of access WAN um, and data center. And yeah. that to me is really, really where the innovation, you'll see almost all, Cisco Live is right around the corner. Um, you know, it's virtual this year, so everyone in the world has access to it. You're going to see a tremendous amount of focus on just that. So how are, how are these going across together horizontally, places in network, as well as north south, you know, up the application stack down to the infrastructure. So that's where I think the future lies right now. No, that's a great, great, great point. I think just one additional point to add to that is I think um, partnerships is gonna be big here, right? I think, um, you know, uh, we are partnering with all the top cloud providers um, a lot of that policy, automation, security that um, Danny was talking about, people, you, you know, what I see customers asking for is I, I, I want that same thing right where the user is, all the way into the data center uh, cloud, right? And for that to really work, um, you know, we need strong partnerships with the cloud providers to do that, to integrate. Um, you know, our products obviously need to be open and programmable, which we're driving and driving through DevNet. Um, and then, um, you know, as we, we can build that tighter integration and then visibility is one, which I think is we're gonna see more and more about, and we didn't really talk much about this, which is having that visibility, right? As, 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 as we start to connect all these different applications across these different networks um, and different clouds, um, 
you know, visibility can provide us with more data, data can provide us with more um, context, and we can start to use, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning to really optimize um, that connectivity, right, between the users and the applications, and then the applications themselves. Great. Yes. Here, you do you do bring up one good point, and I'm sure Julia was so anxious to get us to the audience, but um, <laughs> I, I think the piece that you just brought up on, on the whole, you know, insights and automation, I mean, I'm almost treating them as fundamental building blocks on this, but in order for what I said to happen, meaning the integrations, the look, act, and feel is one, it yeah. is very much predicated on being able to collect massive amounts of data, uh, combine, you know, correlate that against what we're seeing in Cisco TAC and that huge data lake that we're able to build from what's happening in, in for, across our large customer base, but then really analyzing that through you know, machines, not humans, and providing better insights up front. If not, we're, we've, just, we've exceeded the, the capacity that humans can handle yeah. at this point to truly play in the, in the pace and the scale uh, that a lot of our customers are, are needing to to provide to their customers. So, great. Hundred percent agree. So we are going to go to questions, and thank you both for this lovely conversation. Um, but I'd also like to introduce uh, Mark Elwanger, um, who is uh, going to join us for the question portion. Um, he's a thought leadership marketing manager uh, in our group as well. Um, so welcome. And let's actually just go right into the first question, which is from uh, Lokesh on LinkedIn. Can you please elaborate on Windows scale factor? Kieran, I don't know if that one's to you or to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might need to get a little bit more details on it. Was it Windows? Windows and on Windows scale factor. Yeah, we might need to we, we might need to circle back on that one. That uh, is fine. Um, if Lokesh, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more, we will be happy to circle back with you. All right. Um, so let's actually go to the next one, which is from Luazi on face on Facebook. Um, what are the benefits of SD WAN compared to legacy MPLS WAN service in a hybrid environment, but on a single cloud provider? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. There's always benefits, right? So I think even with a single cloud provider, right, I think uh, the benefits of SD-WAN are around being able to, um, you know, being able to utilize any type of connectivity from the branch, right, to that cloud provider, right? In many cases, um, you know, if you had a primary link, you probably had a backup link you're paying for. Hopefully you had a backup link. <laughs> and that backup link was sitting there and you're paying for it monthly. So if you can enable that backup link and SD-WAN is able to pass traffic over both of those links, then you know, you've just doubled your bandwidth, right? And uh, that's ultimately going to help with your user experience. And then two is, is really now we can use those, we can be a little bit more smarter as to how we use those two links, which is I can start to send more of my business critical traffic over maybe my MPLS link. Um, and then maybe non, you know, guest Wi-Fi traffic or, you know, social media traffic over over my backup link, and and I can always make sure that no matter what happens, my uh, my um, most business critical traffic is always prioritized. And SD WAN is continuously monitoring the links and performance, so I can actually set SLAs um, and make sure that if the the latency jitter for uh, that particular application degrades on that link, I can I can switch over to the, the, the second link. I actually think that's probably one of the biggest, biggest benefits is knowing, you know, typically we resort to just a routing problem or, yeah. you know, something very less sophisticated when it comes yeah. to transport availability, where SD-WAN has really changed the game is in that, that consistent monitoring and that SLA maintaining yeah. links. So that's, yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. And Luazi, check it back with us. I know that we've got an SD WAN Cisco chat coming up sometime fairly soon, I think over the summer. So we'll probably talk a whole lot about that. Yeah. All right. So um, the next question I have is uh, from Arif on YouTube. Um, he says, I have a server on my premises. How do I configure in a Cisco cloud without disturbing my running environment? Um, maybe that's on the data center side. Julie, read that just back one more time, please. 
Sure. Um, so Arif has a, a server that's on premises um, and wants to know how to configure in a Cisco cloud without disturbing a running the running environment. I think I probably would need the, the question maybe needs a little bit more information because there there isn't a um, there is we don't have a like Cisco cloud. We usually I mean unless you're calling the on premise maybe you're referring to the on premise as a as a Cisco cloud. I mean from a configure I don't know there's there would be so many specifics that I would yeah. need on that information to talk about how to how to you configure could give, it. Um, yeah, you can the ACI example right, which is if I have an on prem, how do I extend that into? Into a cloud. Yeah, so I mean, if we look at it from maybe we're so the server itself is, is obviously not going to move if we were trying to extend into into um, a public cloud. But you know, really, what we're talking about is beyond the server. It's really at the application layer. You know, what does the application look like when it gets transported, or the data, the data itself? It's actually something that I alluded to. I'm not sure if I'm going to be answering the question exactly, but I think it it points out um, a very common problem that a lot of customers face today is, you know, they've got this on-premise application, this on-premise on workload that they don't feel like they want on-premise any longer. And, you know, it's not as simple as just a port. I can't just, just drop it into another cloud. It, you know, as is, is, is easy as that sounds, it just does not work that way. Um, there is a fair amount of configuration that needs to be done in the new environment. No different than if you move one application to a different server type. I mean, you'd have a similar set of problems if you converted from Linux to Windows, for example. It's a whole set of underlying issues. I, I do think though, um, and I alluded to it earlier, but there are a lot of tools, both Cisco and non-Cisco tools that really help facilitate that move. And then when it comes to configuration policies, securities, VLANs, um, which are uh, APGs uh, in ACI, you know, being able to normalize all of that really helps in the complexity of that move. So uh, again, it's a really tough answer to, without getting a little extra context, but there are a lot, a lot of phenomenal tools to help simplify that move. Great. Um, the next one is also from Wazi on Facebook. Uh, can Cisco Umbrella also be used for WAN optimizing? Um, yeah, so, so I think that's an interesting question. I think it, what we're seeing, I think, from a WAN optimization perspective, right, is that, um, you know, the we've seen a lot of the core WAN optimization functionality start to move into SD-WAN, right? And so, um, and, and you've seen a lot of the WAN optimization vendors evolve to SD-WAN. So as we, you know, at Cisco, we had our SD-WAN products, we had our WAN optimization products as well, and we still do. Uh, but what we're seeing is customers start to ask, hey, you know, I, I don't necessarily need the whole thing. I need pieces of it, and I need things like TCP optimization, forward error correction, data deduplication, de 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 and those type of capabilities. So as we've seen the market evolve, we're bringing in the the the, the functionality into SD WAN. I think what really um, is going to move the needle is really around starting to tightly integrate SD WAN with Umbrella, right? So you have you know, so you're optimizing your applications. Uh, out, uh, for data going out of the branch, and then you're using uh, Umbrella to to do uh, um, to do the security. So that's that's typically the model that we see uh, IC customers using right now. The next question is, I think, really timely um, and something that is a concern both on the enterprise side and the consumer side. Um, this is from Abdi on LinkedIn. How do you manage privacy across the multi cloud? Yeah, I think I can I can take that one, Danny. Um, and sure. feel free to jump in. I think that uh, we we sort of discussed about that um, uh, a little bit earlier on, uh, and I think it's twofold as well, which is I think making sure that we are using encryption, um, which is a given. I mean, in many cases, SD WAN SD WAN is built on an overlay, um, on some type of uh, dynamic VPN overlay. Uh, and that, you know, that encrypts that data uh, end to end, right? So it doesn't matter what's in the middle or how many networks are in the middle, then we, we encrypt that data. And um, so that's, that's, that's one thing. And then um, I, I think the other piece of this, which is 
also a, an adjacent discussion is around as more and more um, enterprises use cloud-based applications, those applications are all using HTTPS, right? And so that data is typically encrypted. So we see a lot of customers um, increasingly uh, having to deal with more encryption uh, on their networks. And so it's a balance between how do we provide uh, secure, security while maintaining privacy. So there's different ways to do that. I think one of the probably the, the most exciting innovations that, that came out of Cisco was encrypted traffic analytics. Um, we, we launched that about three years ago, which is really about using artificial intelligence and machine learning to determine whether or not there is an encryption um, inside of data, right? Without actually looking at the data itself. So we're still, you know, we're still passing that data, but we're not looking inside the the, the, the packet. We're actually using the header to determine whether or not there, there's there, there's a, a malware hidden within uh, within that encryption uh, encrypted data. I think uh, just to sort of append to that from the from the DC perspective, and you know, once you're inside the cloud, um, I think that. You'll, you'll often hear us talking about what we refer to as a zero trust model, right? Where we're, we're really starting with that whitelist model of we don't trust anybody and how do we figure out who we allow? One of the biggest problems that I've seen with, you know, a lot of developers have just fell in love with the convenience of the cloud. I mean, it, you know, simple as I'm not even really exaggerating a swipe of a credit card and I have a tremendous amount of resources available to me not to mention platforms that I can build on that I don't have to wait for IT to turn up that I can really start developing really high up in the application stack immediately, I mean, within minutes. And that's great to get a concept on or do the dev side of it. But when it's time to make that application go production and you, you do wanna hand it back to IT, there's a tremendous amount of struggle there. Uh, and there's this race to, hey, I've gotta get this out in front of my competition as opposed, you know, versus how do I keep this secure to alleviate breaches and us being the next company on the, you know, front page of whatever major newspaper is your favorite, right? So, um, so in that piece, you're, you know, the, the one of the big pieces in this whole unified multi-cloud experience has been how do I establish a security policy once and being able to leverage that no matter where the workload sits. And so having the hooks into AWS, Azure, bare metal clouds, uh, edge locations, that really, really changes the game when it comes to end-to-end -end cohesive security. And I look at it in three different elements. One is workforce, workload, and workplace. So for workforce, it's multi-factor authentication. At Cisco, we use dual, and um, for work, Low, we obviously use tetration. You know, Danny mentioned zero trust policy. Um, how do you get zero trust policy unless you know exactly who everybody's talking to, and that's where tetration comes in place. Um, and then workforce, obviously we have something called SD access to make sure you're authenticated and you are who you are. You get assigned to a group, and that group is allowed certain access to certain applications in parts of your network. So. Cool. Great. All right, let's see here. So. I've got a question from Greg, who's watching on Cisco.com. Uh, can you give your thoughts on when a customer should use direct internet access versus a co-location uh, versus backhauling to the data center? Yeah, I can take that one. That's a really, really great question. Spent a lot of time on this one. <laughs> and um, I, I think, you know, just trying to understand the reasons. And I think, uh, frankly, it, it comes down to use case and compliance, right? I think that what we're seeing is um, that certain industries, uh, you know, finance is a great, great, great example of not allowing direct internet access to the branch. And so they want to, you know, they're, they're going to continue to kind of backhaul that um, to the data center. But you know, if we look at very large global financial institutions, then, you know, the backhauling thing may not really work for them, right? And so what they're doing is they are doing what's called uh, creating regional hubs using co-location facilities like Equinix. And um, so if I have a thousand branches distributed over the world, then potentially what I could do is use a co-location facility in North America and have a hundred branches there 
go to that co-location facility and then go out to the internet, right? And then the folks in APJC could potentially go through, you know, Australia or, or Singapore. So you're building these co-location hubs and you're regionalizing your internet access versus having a thousand direct internet access points um, that you need to manage across the, across the globe. Great. All right, let's see here. Um, how about, um, what will be the effect of applying SDN in cloud integration to a Cisco hardware product? I think Danny, that one's for you. <laughs> what, would be the, what would be the impact, did you say, or what would be the effect of effect. adding? I think impact would probably work too. Yeah. What would be the impact of adding SDN to? Say that one more time, Julie. I'm a little slow. Um, SDN and cloud integration to the to Cisco hardware production. SDN and cloud integration to Cisco hardware production. I, unless I'm not understanding the question, I feel like um, I feel like like this is what we. This is what we do. I mean, it, you know, so the, I mean, the impact of it is is really been to provide that more universal, um, you know, that more universal, cohesive look and feel, regardless of where locations are. So, so we have taken a very cloud agnostic approach. If that is not obvious, right? Cisco is not trying to be in the cloud provider business. What we're really trying to offer is. One, transport, so a lot of what Kieran is talking about with SDN, trying to optimize the availability and the transport between clouds. So that shows itself in the hardware that sits on premise, and then usually the virtualized version of that hardware that sits inside of a yeah. bare metal or a public cloud. And then the same exact thing is, is happening on the data center side where you know, on premise, we have a physical switch, a physical spine switch, a physical leaf switch, a physical controller that runs on an appliance. And in the world of AWS or Azure, you've now taken a virtualized version of that that runs based on the platform that AWS provides. Or if you look at it like an IBM or an Oracle that offers a bare metal cloud, that being able to run a true virtualized our package and install it with a bring your own license. So if I, I hope I'm answering it correctly, but the idea is, is that not to come up with new versions of hardware or software, it's to really replicate the functionality in the platform, regardless of where you want to run it. And to me, that is the key is, is normalizing and trying to keep the consistency because then very easily the management platforms, the security platforms, the automation platforms, all can be leveraged um, universally across. And it sounds so easy to do. I know for years, you know, I said I was on the, on the customer side and you would, it's a different set of problems, but all within the same vein. And, you know, spending, an, you know, 10 or 15 years now on the vendor side, um, you, you realize it's just how difficult that is to, to maintain. But I, I, I do believe that we're in a really, really good place right now with that. Like I said, we hit an inflection point and we're really playing playing well in that space. Great. Well, a sign of doing it well means uh, it or is when it sounds like it's really easy. So I guess we're making it look easy. So I'm sure uh, a lot of customers are just up there like, yeah, it's, it's very easy. So we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying, guys. I mean, every set of innovations is around simplifying this. And you'll see some really cool stuff coming out in uh, Cisco Live next week yeah. that I really I, I mean that's where i think this movement is going it's like a lot of the ingredients are there it's how do we make this just continue to simplify it so that more and more customers can adopt it without needing a doctorate's degree to do it so a lot of innovation there fantastic so thanks so much everyone for all the questions and that's all we have time for today a great reminder from danny to check in um check out cisco live next week um, I'd like to thank our guests, Danny, Kieran, and Mark, and it was a great session as always. Um, so don't forget to check out our Global Networking Trends Report to learn more about the future of multi-cloud, and check out our multi-cloud resources at cisco.com, go multi-cloud. And of course, continue to check out comments and questions on our Cisco chat hashtag. See you next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, everyone.
Pebble Beach. The first US Open Championship in history to bring fully secure course-wide Wi-Fi to fans, players, broadcasters, and event organizers. We're not just talking about players' scores and ball positions.